All right, we're live. So I'm gonna give folks just a few minutes to hop on and connect. I think people are probably grabbing some lunches and multitasking a little bit as they're gonna listen to our panel today. So we'll give folks just a few seconds to get settled in here. Um, and you know, while we're waiting, I would just like to say thank you and welcome to everyone for joining us. This is a special edition of the Returns Report that I know a lot of you tune into and watch and that we hear from. So thanks for joining us with this new format of a Lunch and Learn this afternoon or this morning, depending on what coast you're on. And I think we've got folks joining in, so we will go ahead and get started. So again, welcome everybody. My name is Larissa Summers. I'm the Chief Marketing Officer at AppToro. And for today's returns report, we are excited to share with you an exclusive sneak peek at some recent research we conducted to understand more about retail returns in the last year and the impacts that's had on the customer experience and on the customers coming to your stores and your retail formats and your e-commerce websites and also the impact that's had, but not only that, how you're choosing to show up for that impact and perhaps invest in technologies to help you manage the influx. So I'm really, really pleased to be able to welcome a very esteemed and experienced panel to join us today. And I know you're all looking forward to hearing their insights as am I. I'm gonna let themselves introduce themselves in just a moment. We've got Leslie Newton, who is the Chief Executive Officer of Plow and Hearth. We have Ken Lim, who is our Senior Vice President of Client Development at Optoro, and Ben Sales, who is our Retail Solutions Advisor in Optoro. But before I let them introduce themselves and tell you a little bit about them, I just do have a few housekeeping notes that I want to walk through that I'm sure you're curious about. Number one is what I love about live webinars, we were actually just chatting about this right before we started, is the interactivity of the session. And so we definitely encourage questions. We are here to educate each other and answer each other's questions. If you do have one, go ahead and submit it in the chat box. And I'm gonna be monitoring that here and doing our best to answer as they come in. Also at the end, um, we will have a Q&A session. And then at the conclusion of today's panel discussion and Q&A, this recording will be made available to everyone who signed up, whether you could join us live or need to you know, do something else, you'll be able to rewatch and re familiarize yourself with the content once the recording comes out. And then of course, the full data report will also be out in a few weeks. So without further ado, I'm gonna let our panel introduce themselves. And Leslie, welcome, and please tell the the audience a little bit about yourself and Plow and Hearth. Thanks, Larissa. Uh, Leslie Newton, and I'm the CEO of Plow and Hearth. Um, we were founded in 1980 as uh, as a catalog retailer of uh, of Hearth and fireplace accessories, as well as things uh, uh, decorating the inside of the home. Um, that assortment is still kind of the foundation of what we do today, uh, although we've uh, significantly branched out in terms of the channels that we do business in. We're very much what you would call an omni-channel retailer at this point. We have a few uh, brick and mortar stores. Um, we did about $90 million top line um, over the course of this, uh, this past year. Um, and, uh, and we've got a number of, of, of smaller brands, uh, Wind & Weather, uh, Viva Terra um, that uh, that operate on our on our same platform and excited to participate today. Thank you, Leslie. Ken. Hey, good afternoon and good morning to all of you as well. Um, Ken Lim, I am responsible for the client development group here at Optoro, and so what that means is uh, we work with uh, prospective. Uh, clients as well as current clients to figure out how the Optoro solution might best fit within their returns management and reverse logistics strategy. So it's very nice to be here and nice to be on the panel. Thank you. Ben. Yeah, uh, good morning and, and good afternoon as well. Um, my name is Ben Sales. Uh, I work primarily with the large account um, retailers, 
primarily focusing on uh, you know looking at how different parts of our platform can work within their their infrastructure. So really more focusing on the solutions. Um, I come to Optoro with 30 years of retail experience coming from IKEA Home Furnishings, working both in Canada and the U.S. Um, you know, background is really focused on supply chain, retail operations, and then lastly, we, uh, we focused on strategic innovation. So um, primarily focused on customer, uh, improving the customer experience. Excellent. Well, welcome to all of you. Really appreciate your expertise and your time today. So let's go ahead and dig into the, the content. So, you know, for all of you who have regularly tuned into the returns report, we talk obviously a lot about the impact that COVID and last year had on returns in retail. And, you know, we have significantly spiked uh, across the board. And according to the National Retail Federation, if you want to put hard numbers to it, Returns were $428 billion in 2020, which is a 16% increase over 2018. $428 billion coming back at retail, um, which is significant. And so what we wanted to understand is looking at uh, the mega retail segment, we asked 250 mega retailers if they had seen this in their businesses. And before we tell you and kind of show you what the results were, I'd love to hear from the folks participating today what their direct experience has been. So our first poll question very simply is, did your returns increase in 2020? We'll give you a few seconds to answer that question and then we will go ahead and share the results. So let's take a look and see what our customer's experience has been here, our participant's experience has been. Yes, wow. And that's a pretty resounding yes, actually. So 77% of you on the call have seen your returns increase, which is a pretty phenomenal number. So Taking a look at what the mega retailer segment told us in the next slide, we can see that in fact, more than half of mega retail also experienced a significant increase in returns. What is very interesting is we also added a, do you know how much your retail returns had increased? And there were actually quite a few folks, 13% that did not know. Um, but, you know, as we look into this, I think, Leslie, you've obviously had very direct experience in the last year. You guys are in a really interesting category that seriously took off, given everybody stays at home and with the categories and the product lines that you guys represent. What was your experience and how did the shift to e-commerce affect your business? Yeah, thanks, Larissa. Um, our business was uh, impacted substantially. Um, of course, it started in March with, with the lockdown, but then in uh, April and May, when brick and mortar stores closed, our business just spiked. Um, I think we were very cautious in terms of how we approached it because we just weren't sure how long that trend was going to last, but it, it continued on throughout the course of the entire uh, year. In fact, though, uh, April and May, we did the equivalent of our Q4 in just those two months. Uh, so that was just really challenging for us. Uh, we were fortunate though um, uh, that we added about 180,000 new customers in, in 2020. Uh, the direct side of our business, which is kind of that piece of business that excludes the Amazons and Wayfarers and Zulilis of the world that we do a lot of business with. Uh, but that direct side of the business uh, went from about 75% online to about 80% online. Um, uh, overall, our sales were up about 40% in 2020, uh, which of course means that our returns were up in 2020 very substantially. Uh, fortunately, as a percent of sales, they weren't up you know, a commensurate amount, uh, which is something that we were, uh, we were very thankful for and, and good to see. Uh, but we were just really fortunate to be right in the middle of where customers wanted to spend their money in, in 2020, decorating, 
uh, inside the home, home organization, uh, that whole work from home uh, trend, um, entertaining friends and family outside and, and smaller, more intimate gatherings and just generally you know, making your space more fun and more functional. Um, and truly, I think people have changed their priorities about where they're gonna spend their money and where they're gonna spend their time. Uh, we're, we're confident that a lot of these behavioral changes are here for the long term and that we're entering kind of a new normal. Uh, a tagline that we'll be launching here very shortly is, is make the place that you are the place that you want to be. And, uh, and we're hopeful that 2021 is going to be another strong year for us. Mm -hmm. I love that tagline. And it's so interesting, Leslie, and hear you talk about what you experienced over the last year and coming into 2021. Obviously, you guys were in such a hot category of home and outdoor living and, you know, decorating your home and your space that you're spending so much time in and the impact and the acceleration that had on your business. And it's interesting to come out of this now with assumptions on what the new normal is going to be because we have a, we're getting a little more clarity there, which we did not have certainly a year ago. Um, so I love that tagline too. That's, that's fantastic and uh, wish you guys a lot of success with that. And I encourage anyone to check out Cloud Hearth if you haven't. They have some really, really cool stuff for your house. Um, Ken, you know, you speak to a lot of our retail partners and, and folks in the industry. Are you hearing similar things as Leslie's story or what are you hearing? Yes, um, very similar. You know, Leslie, when, when, when you said 40% year over year growth for your e-com channel, <clears throat> the, um, the, the phrase that, that we often heard, you know, especially towards the end of last year, as folks reflected on the, the full year was, you know, we had a forecast for our e-commerce channel and we were seeing and actualizing volumes that we weren't expecting until about 2024, 2023. So that, that acceleration was, was tremendous. Um, on, on the other hand, you know, it, the, the, it, like all of last year hit different retailers differently. Um, a lot of that was based on what the majority of the categories uh, that they sold uh, was a big factor into how um, the total sales volumes would have changed year over year. Um, not surprisingly, uh, companies that were predominantly um, things like uh, apparel or formal apparel saw a very different outcome than did someone like like Plow and Hearth or other companies that sold essentials. But across the board, what even and, and that probably explains a little bit why on this on this uh, you know question of did did you did you see returns increase or not you know for some companies where their overall sales volume may have actually gone down year over year um, their return rate um, would have still gone up so meaning their sales volumes were down absolute return numbers may have been flat or down but return rates across the board 100% was always up um, so, and, and that's just the raw reality of shifting mix of your business from more brick and mortar to, to online sales, where as many of us know, the return rates for online sales is oftentimes two to four times that of brick and mortar spend. Um, so all, equally as important though, with just the overall, whether you had more returns come in or whether the return rates were going up, what we saw and what we continue to see a lot of retail brands struggle with is where those returns are showing up. Um, historically, when you had your full uh, line of brick and mortar stores still open, folks who are buying stuff online would always, almost always 80, 90% walk it back into the store. That's no longer true as much, right? Um, so that means that um, the mail-in return volumes were spiking and have been spiking. And so that just leads to a more expensive returns processing costs. Uh, both on the inbound shipping as well as processing in the distribution centers. We hear that uh, for a lot of retailers, a mail-in returns motion means that you're now tying up very precious fulfillment center capacity. And even simple things like even if customers, uh, online customers are walking things back into your store, the growth in your online business means that it's more, there's a higher probability that customers are walking back into your store with online exclusive SKUs, which makes it harder for you to process those in store and just overall makes it harder for you to bring it back into your supply chain. So uh, just a few of those factors, kind of what we've been hearing across the board. So lots of complexity there in a lot yeah. of different areas of, of returns. And 
one thing that I think is so interesting that you said that may not be obvious, but when you said it, it makes so much sense is, you know, a lot of businesses were accelerated and actually grew sales meaningfully because of the categories they were in and the demand that matched, you know, what was necessary for us as consumers last year. But even if your business was not fortunate in that way and your business actually decreased, you still had increases in returns because of the shift onto online when brick and mortar shut down, which I think is a really important and interesting distinction. Ben, from your vantage point, you know, you heard Leslie's experience, you heard what Ken is seeing. Does this line up with what you're seeing as well or what do you have to add? Yeah, I mean, to be honest, I'm, I'm actually surprised. I'm a little bit surprised that 13%, that that percentage isn't a lot higher, mm -hmm. mostly to support what Ken and, and Leslie are saying around, um, but that increase of e-com sales, I mean, I think it's going to, it's a, probably a lot harder to grasp, you know, where that's impacting you. Um, but then I also kind of look at the other side and I think a little more historically, and, and I'm also not surprised that retailers don't have a good picture of, um, you know, where the returns have increased or not, because typically um, returns are not just wasn't cost center in your P and L. And because of that, then the ownership isn't always clear within your organization. So it doesn't become a focal point. Um, you know, we see a large number of retailers that look at returns as just a cost of doing business, but we now know obviously through COVID and through, you know, what we're seeing um, as the e-com sales grow, that's going to be a much, much bigger cost. Um, and now it's starting to really stand out. So in my experience, retailers are only going to focus on returns when it becomes an issue. So if you have trailers of returns sitting at the back door or warehouses overflowing, kind of like as Ken was saying. So um, my question really then is back to the retailers is, are you taking actions that are looking at the total cost, thinking holistically, uh, or are you only just diving in and treating one system and then throwing good money after bad and never really getting to that solution that could ultimately save costs, you know, drive customer retention and, and ultimately improve the customer experience. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's such a good point. And I think really illustrative of how returns, like you said, span so many different departments, the supply chain department and impact finance, we'll see the cost, right? Mm -hmm. um, forward marketing, like we'll sell out of SKUs, but then those SKUs are still coming back in returns that could be sent back to stock. And so they're kind of interested in closing that loop, but everyone has a slightly different purview, but the piece of that is in there you know, is definitely impacting them, but unifying that is difficult. Um, and it's been reactive, like you said, Ben, like it has to kind of become a really pro big problem and then you react to it in the moment, which actually is an interesting segue into our next segment, which talks about, you know, we talked about the impact to retail, right? But what is the impact to your customers who are buying all of these things, had to move online and inevitably, something didn't work out properly or it's not the right color or you get it in your house and it's not a match. So the return experience comes into play, which is a really big part of the customer journey and buying, returning, and then coming back to buying, developing that loyalty, right? Returns is such a big part of that. And so according to our research, you know, at Optoro, we've actually seen that up to 42% of consumers have had such a negative returns experience that they will not go back to that retailer, which as a marketer is so terrifying, right? Because I spend so much time trying to talk to my audience, understand, empathize, create content that resonates, get them to come in, get them to buy, only to lose them after all of that has happened. We've spent all that time and money and then they don't come back because of a bad returns experience. And so, you know, we talk a lot about the importance and the strategic nature of returns actually on loyalty. And when we looked at this in our research with uh, you know, the piece we just did in those same 250 mega retailers, we said, how do you think this affects the customer experience? Are you bought in to this affecting the customer experience or not? Which actually brings me to our next poll question before we tell you what the report said. I'd love to hear, does your company believe, you know, I'm sure a lot of people on this call believe this, but do you feel like your company believes that the returns experience really affects customer loyalty. So I'll give folks a few minutes to answer that question. Um, this is a this is an interesting one, and I think what what we're finding is you know the start of last year, let's say before the world changed, January, 
February-ish, I think people were a little like, had to make the leap. Like, does this really impact the journey? And is this an important enough thing to prioritize to solve for? Some retailers were very much there. Others had to be really thoughtful about whether they believe this or not. So let's see what our uh, audience says. Woo, yes, wow. I'm telling you guys, a year ago, this number would have been so different. This would not be 94%. This would be significantly lower. Wow, have times changed. This is super interesting. And thank you guys for voting on that. So what the research told us, if we can go to the next slide, was um, nearly 70%, which is still pretty high. <laughs> not 94, but our, you know, our audience knows what's up, right? 69% um, of retailers in this mega segment, 250 said, yes, we know it impacts the customer experience, which Leslie brings me back to you. You know, I think your story is so interesting and what happened with, e with the, you know, the impact on e-com and your business with COVID is so interesting. But you, I think, saw this before you had to a little bit. So I'd love to hear, you know, your journey to recognizing this was a customer experience issue and then, you know, how you have kind of solved for that and where you looked to turn to the solutions to kind of plug those gaps. Well, I can't say that we've always felt as strongly as we do today about the customer experience. Um, on the return side, I've always been a, a big fan of retailers who had a really slick experience, the, the Nordstrom's and the Zappos, for example. Um, but it is absolutely key to delivering a great experience throughout the, throughout the whole journey. Um, it was about three years ago um, when we really just began focusing more intensely on the customer experience and, and the whole journey from beginning to end. An initiative that we kicked off here called Relate. Uh, and it was as much about getting our customers to buy again as it was about acquiring new customers, because obviously the latter is so much more expensive than keeping the ones that you have. Uh, for us, product quality, fulfillment, customer service are all core competencies of what we do, and we think we do those extremely well. Uh, but returns was just not an area that we were particularly proud of. Um, and definitely shy of what I would call kind of best in class. Uh, so we felt like returns was really going to be an area that we had to focus on if we were going to look at the, at the whole customer journey. Mm -hmm. Easy returns can really help a customer make a decision that she might waver on otherwise. Uh, just to give a, a personal example, I mean, recently I just bought four dresses from Nordstrom's for my daughter's wedding. Um, obviously, I don't need four dresses for one event. Um, and I returned two of them. I only needed one, but I hate shopping for cocktail dresses. I don't know who doesn't. So it was a win-win for a win for me, win for, for Nordstrom's at the end of the day. I bought twice as much as I would have normally bought. So whatever we can do to elevate that experience uh, and to increase that rebuy rate is uh, extremely beneficial for us. And to that note, um, in 2020, our rebuy rate increased by about 10% over 2019. Uh, obviously, COVID didn't hurt that, considering the trends in the categories that we're in, but um, I'm pretty confident that uh, the improvements that we've made in the whole customer experience were, were uh, contributory factors to that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I love that you mentioned the rebuy rate because I think, you know, we see some people track that and others, you know, we, we highly encourage people to track that as a, as a key KPI. I'm not sure if everyone on the call does, but really, really an important piece to look at, as you mentioned in the, in the retention journey. So great, um, great insights there. Ken, you know, are you tracking with what Leslie's saying with all the other conversations you're having or what is the kind of framework look like out there with respect to retailers on the customer experience side of this issue? Yeah, uh, for sure, very similar um, themes out there when I'm speaking to retailers. Um, the way, <clears throat> what I've heard, which is an, alter, an alternate view on kind of rebuy, rebuy rate, Leslie, is, you know, when I speak with retailers, they, they think of also about just like effectively the one and done customers that they're afraid about, right? Meaning last year, so much of their selling volume shifted from brick and mortar, or they're just acquiring net new customers online. Online customers are typically, especially the first time buyers are <clears throat> pretty expensive from an acquisition cost standpoint. So 
um, just trying to avoid that one and done customer and build that really strong customer loyalty and lifetime value. And traditionally, um, you know, you, we've all been, and especially, you know, Leslie, you've been in retail for quite a while. Um, retailers think everything from merchandising to product description pages all the way down to it, keep encouraging more and more of this robust customer experience. I'd say it's almost like a journey. Um, the, the, the entire concept of post-purchase experience, um, the, the forward order tracking, kind of the, the, the technology and the things that retailers do to help the customer answer the question, where's my order, has now kind of extended a little bit further, right? So now, <clears throat> how can I get this back to you if, I, if it just doesn't work for me? And where's my refund? And that's kind of the next I guess, wave, I would think, in, in the overall improvement against customer experience. Now, having said all of that, you know, it, that, it, it's interesting that on the folks in this call, almost 100% said, yep, I get it. <clears throat> I, my company understands the impact of customer experience. But when I look at the number on this page, I'm like, well, there's still about a third of folks that we surveyed that said, we don't. Right? Either, I don't believe that my, my company actually draws that direct correlation between um, a good return experience versus a, a, a strong customer experience, which is, you know, as a consumer, that that is that is shocking, right? I mean, I would think that for almost all of us, at least conceptually, you know, with, as you think about our personal experiences, Leslie with her Nordstrom experience, us buying from Zappos at, or Amazon, almost, I would have thought that almost everyone would agree at that, at, 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 by this point, that the, <clears throat> the retail returns experience is a direct impact on customer experience. I think, Larissa, what you said kind of hit home for me, which is it is difficult for a lot of companies to draw that direct correlation between um, a customer return something um, to, to then, because it hits so many different parts of the business. So oftentimes when we work with retailers at the outset, if, if there isn't a singular focal point um, within the company that is thinking about returns and how it impacts all the other uh, parts of the business, we have to help make a connection uh, for them and with them. There are going to be, there are going to be parts of the, the retail operations that are more obvious where a, a stronger retail returns experience will impact, like call center volume. But then there are also going to be softer parts of it mm -hmm. that, that is harder to, 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 uh, to, to correlate to, to customer experience and customer loyalty. So mm -hmm. overall satisfaction, for example. So when we engage with a client, oftentimes we start <clears throat> working with retailers and say, okay, well, let's try and, and look at a customer satisfaction score for a customer. And let's look at that and see how we can draw the correlation between that CSAT score on the returns journey back to your, to your customer loyalty metric. Mm -hmm. And I think it's CSAT and retention. Leslie, as you mentioned, it's like, if you're going to invest in retention, you can really understand what's causing them to, you know, a trip and then, is, you know, solve the issue at each point of, you know, falling out of the funnel on a loyalty basis. So those two things are really good pieces of advice. CSAT, retention, rebuy rate, third uh, important point. Ben, what have we missed in this conversation so far? Yeah, it, I hate to say it, but I think maybe we've missed a little bit of um, what the customer expectation actually is once ah. once a company has decided to invest in in improving that experience. What is what is the customer actually looking for? And so that's why, I, I mean, I absolutely think returns is a, the critical part of that customer journey. Because, I mean, this is where the customer is, you know, unfortunately, they've now had to return something that they're maybe a little disappointed and and now they're going to about to experience here that returns process for the very first time. So that whole first step, um, I always use the analogy, I mean, you get something on your doorstep and even though you ordered it, it feels like Christmas morning and you're all excited to unwrap it and open it up and can't wait to try it on or, you know, unwrap it, etc. But then ultimately it's not what you want. So then now you have to go to the dentist and, the, you know, going to the dentist, everyone has to do it. But the unfortunate thing is that no one loves to do it. So it, if we can make that returns experience a good one, you know, give them the expectations. Because, I mean, today customers, they expect a, a do-it-yourself easy to use solution, such as an online portal. They don't want to call a customer service center any longer. They definitely don't want to have to try and get some kind of authorization number or fill out a form. Um, I don't know about you, but I don't have a printer at home, so please don't ask me to print a label. 
Um, you know, I, Ken, I was printing labels at the office. I'm sorry, it's probably a bad thing to do, but um, I mean, that's, that's the reality. And now people being working from home, they just don't have that capability. What I really want as a customer is I want a QR code on my phone that's gonna enable me to be able to drop off an item in the store immediately and then just process, finish processing that return or UPS or even better, a third party location. Um, you know, where your business has been able to partner, such as like a Kohl's or a Staples um, or curbside. I mean, curbside is now the new the new expectation. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you see it through through uh, curbside pickup, but we also want to see curbside drop off. Um, and then lastly, and I'm, and I'm literally just sitting next to a pile of returns that are still maybe from Christmas. Uh, and it's all because I don't have tape. I don't actually have clear tape to tape up anything. So customers, they don't want to tape or rebox anything or even create packaging. So packageless returns are now the new norm. So if you can just take it, like I said, to one of those locations and just drop that off with your QR code and hit the road, mm -hmm. that's, that's, that's what customers are looking for. So, yeah. Well, and I think we talked about this as a panel the other day when we were kind of preparing and necessity is the mother of invention, right? Mm -hmm. And so these technologies you're talking about, the QR codes, the package list drop-offs, curbside pickup and drop-off, like these are things that are now part of our world already. Many retailers are doing these, but it will become a customer expectation if it hasn't already, right? So really super interesting stuff. And Ben, your honesty is very refreshing about the printer. I'll talk to Ken, I'll smooth it over with him. I think you might not be alone in that one. Um, so thank you for that. All right, moving on to our final topic here is, you know, okay, so returns increased for just about everybody. A lot of folks on this call, a lot of folks in the industry experience, it's an important part of the customer experience and journey and it impacts retention and it impacts some really core, core things as a, as a consumer, which obviously as retailers, we care deeply, deeply about what are we gonna do about it, right? Are we gonna invest? in solving this um, and how are we gonna do that? So before I go to the research report answer, let's go ahead and do our poll and ask folks on this call. So you guys have already you know, indicated how expert you are in understanding the impact of returns and that returns have in fact increased. So are you as an organization prioritizing returns technology? Um, are you, you know, investing in this? Is this something that's reached the level of priority for budget and discussion on that front. So let's give folks a moment to put their lunches down and come back to that mouse and answer this question. And then we'll take a look at what you guys are doing about it. So, Let's take a look. Yes. Wow. Okay. 70, 69, almost 70% of you are very much prioritizing this, which is great to hear. And I'm not surprised because of the answers that you had to previous questions. So looking at what our report told us, so 56%, well over half are investing in this returns technology in 2021. 22% of those are going to be investing specifically in returns processing technology with the goods themselves coming back in and being able to process them. And 16% are investing in returns portals. I do expect this number will keep going up. Much like we talked about, these numbers have gone up in certain areas. Coming into 2021, I expect this number, if we do this, I guarantee if we do this report again in six months, that number is going to be a lot higher. Um, so, you know, let's take it back to Leslie. You know, what made you guys recognize the need to prioritize a technology solution? And then how has that journey been for you? Are you seeing results? Yeah, so we started out looking to improve the process and just deliver that better customer experience. But I'm also a big believer in the fact that we can't be great at everything. And, um, and if you're not great at it, then you should look at, at partners that are experts in that and just reduce your focus to those things that that you are uh, are really core to you. 
But then we started looking at the space and the labor that was consumed in our warehouse, the calls that were coming into our contact center, and it's just the, the sheer complexity of having returns in the midst of the receiving and the fulfillment process and what that created. And that's what really pointed us to the outsourcing solution. Uh, interestingly, we were, we were headed down that road with your, one of your competitors when we just asked a pretty simple question, you know, who else in your space does this well? Um, most of the time you don't get an honest answer to that question, uh, but in this case, they referred us to Optoro. Um, and uh, so we reached out, hooked up with, uh, with Ben at the, at the NRF conference and then started down the, the path with, with Optoro. Um, and one of the things that really led us to select, uh, select Optoro over some of the other uh, folks in the space was the quality of the people. Um, we just really felt like, uh, like they had a willingness to listen to what we needed and to build that partnership. Um, and that's continued to be the case as we continue to, to work to really take this process to maturity for us. Uh, the tipping point was really the ability for us to be able to fulfill the product that's returned to stock out of, out of your warehouse and not bringing that back into our warehouse. Um, and then on top of that, you know, the roadmap that held some really interesting enhancements like express returns at the staple stores that we've talked about, uh, that's going to be a huge cost savings for us and for our customer as well. Um, and then instant credit, which we, we think will be a sales lift for our customers. But uh, overall, so far, we're pleased with the process. Uh, just the, the sheer simplification alone um, to our distribution center operations in this COVID crunch uh, was just really helpful to us. I'm so thankful that we made that decision before the, before the, the crisis and our, and our, our sales uh, you know, really increased. Our customer satisfaction store scores so far um, are continuing to improve throughout the year, and we're looking for that to continue. Um, next for us is to is to direct the returns that we get from marketplaces, which um, I don't know how many of you are in the business of reselling on Amazon or Wayfair, but what you, what you get back from them is just a nightmare, and to be able to be, get rid of all of that is going to be uh, basically get us out of the returns business altogether, which I'll be thankful for. Uh, so we're really looking forward to the next couple of phases uh, where the customer experience and the economics of it will really improve that much further. Um, you know, on a final note, uh, Jeff Bezos at Amazon is famous for saying that decisions are either a one-way door or a two-way door. Um, and this was a decision that was a one-way door. Uh, so it was a really tough decision for, uh, for us to make, um, but, uh, but I'm really thankful that we made it and um, really thankful for the timing of, of when we made it. Yeah, yeah. Well, we really appreciate, appreciate your candor in kind of explaining your process there and, and how you measure success and the impact it's had. So really, really appreciate that um, explanation, Leslie. And, you know, Ken, uh, you know, I know you speak to a lot of retailers. Um, I think Leslie is such an, and Plow and Hearth, they're such an incredible example of, you know, data-driven, customer-focused, know what their strengths are, know what their priorities need to be, know where they need to partner, you know, where they need to say no to internal resources and yes to external, which is the hallmark of a very well-run business. What do you see in terms of, you know, discussions around investing in returns, given everything we've talked about today? Yeah, uh, great question. And oftentimes, you know, where, where we get invited to the table is usually around that moment when either we're in discussion and a retailer says the word's core competence, and that, that is kind of usually when the, the journey and the exploration and discovery begins, which is, what, what is the retailer's core competence and how much of the, uh, the, the returns portion of that post-purchase experience is, a, is part, of the, part of the core competence. And if not, then we get into a, a discovery process to, to, to figure out, is it worth it to uh, invest in one or more parts of the different technology pieces that we offer, whether it's in the returns management processing aspect or in the portal and the customer experience aspect. You know, what's, what's interesting to Larissa as I think about it is 
you know, to your earlier point, I, I, I don't know if it's you or me or a combination of both of us that said, you know, sometimes it's, it's the, we don't know what we don't know and how do I know whether I can justify this investment? Um, sometimes we, 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 start, we start that exploration as simply as saying, hey, let's, let's do a returns audit for you and with you, right? And it, it, it involves just going through the entire process and benchmarking a retailer's uh, returns experience and the returns outcomes. Uh, with what, what else we see out in, in, in the marketplace. Um, what we do know is that, you know, when it's interesting that, you know, Leslie, you started with us on the returns processing side and then now, now kind of layering on with the returns portal and the returns experience. Um, what we do know is that oftentimes it's easier for folks to start with the returns portal side because, because it's that much more front and center to, uh, to the direct uh, customer experience. But regardless, uh, whether it's on um, re-examining some of their prior assumptions about a whether a digitized returns portal is right for them or not, um, or rethinking whether they ought to fully outsource uh, the processing side of the business or take uh, uh, our processing technology and putting it into their distribution center. Um, what we found is that when done right, it has it has pretty big impacts on both the, the customer experience, but then even on the back end, the, the processing side can have a pretty big impact both in labor planning, uh, the time that you can bring stuff back to stock, and frankly, just the flexibility to look at uh, how you want to use uh, fulfillment center capacity and what you choose to, um, to sharpen on, on, on that side of the, uh, the research journey. Ben, I think I'm creating a new segment called Ben. What do we miss? Ben, <laughs> what do we miss? I mean, I, I totally zeroed in on the returns portal. To be honest, um, I, I'm surprised to be also to be honest to say that only 16% will invest in that portal. So, I mean, we know that 45% of retailers are using then some kind of homegrown solution or something that they've already purchased, um, which. I mean, again, I go back to that's that first meeting in the customer journey, right? And and it's key to driving the loyalty. So that being said, um, the retailers that have a homegrown solution, are they constantly updating and refreshing them? Uh, or have they built it and now, you know, they just, they let it run? Because as I talked about before, um, if the customer expectation is evolving, uh, constantly then is it delivering what the customer is looking for today so um i mean we know in an earlier optoro survey that the majority of consumers say that the returns portal makes that returns experience that much easier so i mean i'll always side with the with the consumer and i think we really need to listen to them because for me they are the experts in customer experience mm -hmm, mm -hmm. absolutely we work for them right not the not the other way around yeah. So, well, that concludes, you know, the core of our discussion. We wanted to open up some time for Q&A and uh, have folks in our audience be able to ask any of our panelists or the entire panel any questions or anything that we missed or that you want us to double down on and explain. We are here and happy to do so. So, I'll give folks a couple seconds to ask any questions that may come up. Um, and we will see what pops in. So I'm just going to go over here and take a look at what we are seeing in terms of questions. So the first question that we're getting, um, I think I'm gonna send this one, Ken, your way which is how does Optoro's returns experience differ from some of your competitors? Sure. Larissa, the, um, so we think of the portal as the sort of front end of the overall returns experience. Um, and so what we offer to our clients is a true end-to-end -end solution from the portal all the way back to the returns management software and the post-processing sort of dispositioning channels. And what this means is that what we're able to do by doing that, by offering this full end-to-end -end solution is to take a lot of the data outcomes and the financial outcomes after those items have been processed 
and then using those to inject back into the front end experience portion or really the portal portion so that on behalf of our retailers, we can help them make better decisions at the point that the customer is initiating that return on, on the retailer's portal. Um, additionally, sort of behind the scenes on the experience side or on the portal side, uh, we provide functionality to drive more repurchase behavior with that customer that is currently engaging with the retailer's website. Um, we effectively offer what we call kind of an instant voucher so that that customer, that online customer is actually encouraged to repurchase uh, either a, a different size of the same SKU or a different SKU entirely. And what this means is that uh, the, the, the retailer or the retail brand reduces that risk of that customer sort of returning something and then turning over to a different competitor's website to go rebuy something else. Thank you. Leslie, it looks like this next, next question is for you. Um, how concerned are you with returns abuse, meaning your consumers are fraudulently returning things or trying to kind of game your system? Is this something you're very concerned about or you don't see enough of that to warrant a big strategic imperative there? Yeah, we really don't see that much of it. I mean, I think they're the fraud, the abuse, and the abuse uh, are really much more prevalent in other areas, like people reselling our stuff on eBay, for example. Um, but no, we really don't see that much on the uh, on the return side. And as a general rule, we'll err on you know, taking the the that the customer is always right and taking the word of the customer. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Ken, is that your experience as well in the conversations you have? Um, it varies, I'd say, in terms of um, how much a retailer would look into returns abuse. It definitely varies depending on uh, what the retailer sells. Uh, not surprisingly, uh, retailers that, that uh, and retail brands that sell higher ASP uh, highly brand cachet types of items are concerned with that, right? So I think like a Gucci or a Rolex or something like that, or even a Tumi, they, they have to build into their own um, overall return strategy, ways and means to validate that returns abuse or ways and means to validate that a, a, a certain profile or certain type of, of shopper may not be showing up and truly abusing uh, returns as a means to need to as a means to make a quick buck. Um, I see this other question, what steps has, has the plural help for retailers to look at returns abuse? Um, uh, you know, while we don't necessarily have an kind of, uh, active um, technology that tries to survey the landscape of, of, of bad actors out there, as part of that instant vouchering system, that instant vouchering functionality that goes with um, our returns portal, uh, our system innately also looks at um, uh, specific buyers, i.e. The, 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 the email addresses, but then also uh, the, the buying pattern of, uh, of, of that individual requesting the returns on the portal. And so if, if our AI-driven kind of uh, functionality thinks that that particular returner may should not receive that instant voucher credit, then it won't. Meaning that, so that way it protects us um, from from that risk of a of a bad actor by extending the voucher where the voucher should not have been, have been extended. Good point, Ken. Thanks for that. And our last question, Leslie. This one is also for you. We talked during the session today about how complicated returns can be for retailers because it does touch and impact so many different departments. As the chief executive officer, obviously you have purview over all of the company and you can really see with your data-driven approach what's going on. As the CEO though, do you put returns responsibility in a particular department or is it a more horizontal approach? Um, interesting. Um, it was kind of owned in two places in our company on the distribution center side. 
Uh, they're the ones that are getting all these goods back and having to, uh, to process those, get them back in stock, or then what to do with the ones that you don't put back into stock. Um, but as we launched um, this customer focus and looking more at the entirety of the journey, we really sort of migrated more to the, cu the customer service area owning that experience. And then certainly as we um, began down the outsourcing path, it, I really transferred ownership almost immediately from the distribution center to, to the customer service uh, folks. So interesting. And does customer service live in e-commerce or in brick and mortar and marketing, which or is it its own department that levels up to the C-suite? It's its own department. Um, and um, it reports to me and uh, it's something that I'm very passionate about and stay pretty, pretty hands-on uh, because it's the, it is the face of our brand uh, and speaking with our customer. And we still have an awful lot of folks that actually pick up the phone and call and want to talk to somebody uh, here in Madison, Virginia. We're proud of that. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's great. And it's so it's so nice to talk to retailers that are so invested in the customer and consider that such a core value for their business. And it's no surprise you guys have had the success you've had and continue to do by prioritizing that. So thank you for that. And Leslie, thank you so much for your time. And You're welcome. For so much of your story with us and our audience today. We know how valuable your time is and how much you have going on. So such an honor to have you here today. Really appreciate it. And Ken and Ben, as always, thank you for your insights and your market knowledge. You guys always have so much more to tell us um, and answer questions we didn't even know we were asking with your, with your information. So appreciate that. And thank you everyone who joined us today or if anyone's listening to this on a recording, Really appreciate it. You can always reach out to us to schedule a demo on our website. Um, if you want to learn more, talk to us directly. And also this recording will be emailed to all of you uh, with the email address that you subscribed to this Lunch and Learn webinar on, and as well as the data report, the full report that we previewed for you here today is also going to be mailed to you. So approximately in the next week. So thank you again. Thank you, panelists. Thank you, audience. And we hope to see you again on a future Lunch and Learn, Lunch and Learn Returns report. Thanks, everyone.